said that they might be one in us. Who? Who be one in us? Everybody. Everybody. Not just the Hebrews. Yeah, it's okay if we be one with each other. But that's not the end game for God, no. God want all his sons and his daughters one in him. Black sons and white sons, Hebrew sons, Gentile sons, Asian sons, Latino sons, that they might all be one in us. He wanted to look like heaven gonna look. Well, you look out and you see every nation, tribe, and tongue, every ethnicity, every nationality. That's what God really wants. That's the unity. It's not only exclusive, we can only do it in him, but it's exhaustive. It includes all the races of Adam's fallen seed. Anybody hear me up in here? All right, all right. Well, y'all listen, we'll be looking at John chapter 17, um, verse uh, starting at about verse 11, and we're going to get cranked up. We got a lot to talk about. I got a lot of information, and so I'm just going to rely on the Holy Spirit to guide me through it. Amen. Anybody happy that the fast is over? Come on. Hallelujah. At least part of you is happy. Amen. Hallelujah. And so uh, thank you all for fasting with us as a church. And we're going to watch the Most High bring that unity. And also, whatever your personal request was, come on, give him praise. Amen. And so, because he's going to do it. He's going to do it. He's going to do it. The answer is yes. Woo! The answer is yes. Hallelujah. So he's going to do it. Just stand in faith. Amen. Because he's already made the decree in heaven. And so, hallelujah. We're going to John 17 verse 11 just want to welcome our out-of-town guests that may be in the house also our online family that's tuning in faithfully amen we praise god for you um continue to send us the satellite locations amen uh, if you're interested continue to do that because soon we're going to be pulling the trigger on that and uh we'll be launching that soon we know that we have houston we know we have la we know we have some things going on in baltimore and so we just kind of computating all of the people in the area amen and we're gonna go ahead and, and and execute amen so keep on sending us this week and next week and then we'll see what we have uh deacon james and we'll go ahead and start those satellite locations come on give y'all some praise amen yeah all right, so John 17, starting at verse 11. Uh, let's go ahead and read. Hallelujah, you good? Glory to God. 17, 11. The Bible says, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these I speak, uh, these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world had hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. Most high, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your way. We thank you for your holiness. We thank you for your grace, your mercy. We thank you for redeeming us from the power of darkness. We thank you for saving us out of the world. We thank you for delivering us from so many things, from drugs, from alcohol, from, hallelujah, the streets, Lord God. 
God, where will we be without you, Father God? We give you praise for our families that you've given us. We praise you for our possessions, our homes, our vehicles. We thank you, Lord God, for the health that we have, God. God, to think about it, everything good that's in our lives, it comes from you, God. So we stop by your house today to give you the praise, God, to give you the honor, God, to give you the glory, God, because you are Yahweh Jireh, our provider, God. You're the one who gave it all, God. You give us the power, hallelujah, to get wealth father God and when you bless us with it God the blessings of the Lord they added no sorrow father God we thank you for your perfect ways O king and we worship you Lord God we not gonna let the rocks outcry us today God because you're worthy God because you're worthy God because you're worthy God you ain't feeding no rock God hallelujah you ain't died for no stone God God you did it for us Lord God so we gonna praise you the Bible say let the redeemed of the Lord say so and so we are saying so today that you're worthy that you're good that you're awesome that you're an on-time God that you might not show up when we want you to but you're always right on time and we thank you God for all of your promises for all the yeses and the amens in your word we thank you for the things you've done the things you're doing and the things you're yet to do we thank you for the yeses we even thank you for the no's we thank you, Lord God, for all things because all things work together for the good of those who love God and call according to his purpose. Now, Father, we pray, Most High, that your presence would be here as we open your sacred book, that you would roll in like a fog, like a mighty rushing wind, that the fire and wind would come and do it again in this place we pray for a Pentecost experience fill us O King fill us all of us to the overflow of your presence let this experience with you in your word change us God not for a day not for a week but change us forever put a hedge of protection around this place a wall of fire a legion of holy angels keep us O King in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Come on, give him glory if you love him. Come on, praise him if he saved you. Come on, shout if he's been good to you. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My God, my God, my God. You know, when you know you don't deserve what he's done. <laughs> that's what gets you when you know you don't deserve what he's done. Amen. And that's where we are all right now, saints. And so, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to go ahead and begin. Let's give praise to God for our worship team. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Brian and Minister Brian and Israel and the crew. We just, we appreciate y'all. We love y'all. Lincoln, Josh, we appreciate y'all so much. Hallelujah. Saints of God, we have been talking about, hallelujah, praying like the master. And we've been going through, amen, just looking at the master's prayer. We saw that he prayed for himself. He prayed for others. And then he prayed for his disciples. He prayed for us as a church. And we've been going through his prayer for us. And it's very important because if any time we needed the prayers of our Messiah, it's right now. Anybody hear me up in here? It's right now. And not only is he praying for you, but I'm praying for you as well. Healing upon your body. Hallelujah with your children. Everything. Amen. And so you covered. Amen. In the name of Yahshua HaMashiach. And when Jesus prays, amen, for us. He prays a variety of different things. He prays, and I'm going to list them out for you, that, he, that we would be kept, that uh, the Father would keep us. He prays for our oneness and our unity, which we'll, we are covering right now. He prays for our joy, which is going to be a joy to teach on, uh, our sanctification. He prays for us to get heaven. 
and he also prays that we might find and ex exhibit love. And so uh, that's the things he prayed for. Amen. And so we covered the keeping him, keeping us from the evil one, ourselves and the world. And we've been on this unity tip. We've been on this oneness tip right now. And that's what we've covered. And we pulled it out of John 17, verse 11, towards the end of the verse. He says, and now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I am come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me. Watch this. That they may be one as we are one, so to speak. And so we began to embark upon this series on, on unity. And we began to quote different people, different quotes. Martin Luther King told us, amen, we must learn to live together as brothers and sisters or perish together as fools. And that's all of us. That's, that's the church. That's the family. That's your business. Amen. That's the Hebrews. We really need to learn how to live together or we're going to perish as fools. Uh, unity is so important for the survival of the family, business, church, nation. Without it, we perish. We also saw another quote, unity is strength, but division is weakness, right? And we understand that whenever you have somebody that's together, is strong, amen, two is better than one, you can accomplish purposes, amen, and we'll go into deeply, amen, about the benefits of this, this unity. But I heard a, another story on unity. Unity, another analogy. Um, they say that if a wolf is ever walking through the woods, all right, and he looks on one side and he sees two little boys playing, two little boys, I'm talking about six, seven years old, two little boys playing, and he looks on the other side of the woods and there's a big strong man, 200 plus pounds, full of muscles, even with a bat or something in his hands. Guess which one the wolf gonna attack first? The one who's alone. The wolf going to attack the one who's alone first. That's how important unity is. Yes, Though you are small, <laughs> but when you're united. Anybody hear me over here? Amen. The devil not going to attack something small and united than something big and divided. Because when it's divided, amen, it's alone. And you can fall. Now, y'all, that wasn't a trick question. I'm sorry I let y'all answer that. <laughs> I was supposed to get it out a little bit faster. But it was just to show the import of unity. It, just, it shocked me when I read it. I said, wow. You know, uh, uh, if spiders would unite, they could tie down a lion. Right. Uh, 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 it is not in numbers, but in unity that our great strength lies. Uh, where there is unity. There is victory. We talked about stuff like that. And we talked about uh, uh, even the quotes that, that, that said, hallelujah, the, the strength of the pack is the wolf. And the strength of the, of the wolf is the pack. All right? Where this oneness gives us our strength. All right? Um, and so Jesus knows how important it is. So he says stuff, a house divided against itself cannot stand. You don't even need an outside enemy. The house can't stand against itself. You understand what I'm saying? And we talked about the Great Wall of China, how they had the wall around the whole nation. And no army could get in. But the armies invaded not because of the wall that was around, but because some people on the inside, the soldiers, sold out their own people. And so it is with the church. So it is with our businesses, so it is with our family, so it is with our nation. God done put walls around the church of God. Anybody hear me up in here? And he done put walls around the Hebrews. And he done put walls around your family. And the only way the devil can slip in is if you sell those institutions out. Anybody hear me up in here? All right. When you are not united in your home, he can't get in. When you're united in the church, he can't get in. When you're united as a nation, the Hebrews, there is no way that he could get in. Because the gates of hell will never prevail against the church of the living God. Come on, give y'all some praise up in here. Hallelujah. It's always an inside job. All right. 
And so we got to fix the inside so we can protect against the outside influences and attacks. And so Jesus prayed for us in this regard. He prayed for our unity because he knew how important it would be. And so I gave you a little roadmap of where we're going to be going talking about this unity. We gave you last time the definition of unity. We talked about uh, uh, point number two, where we going, the basis of unity. That's what we'll be talking about. Number three, the benefits of unity. We probably not going to get to that. Num number four, the hindrances of unity. And number five, restoring our unity. When we talked about the definition of unity, it is the state of being one, united, singleness. We talked about the definition of unity as several points, parts joined together in agreement. We talked about the definition of unity. It's a condition of harmony, one accord, continuity without deviation. Because when you're in unity, it produces a beautiful, harmonious song. Yeah. All right? Because that's all music is, different instruments coming together with one purpose, one goal. That's what unity is, is harmony. And I bet it's music to God's ears when his people come together. Huh? Anybody hear me up in here? But remember, we talked about, hallelujah, the, the, the orchestra director. We, they asked him, what's the hardest instrument to play? And he says, second fiddle, second violin, second flute. And what destroys our unity and our harmony is that everybody want to be first place. Everybody want to be the boss. All right? And we're in an age of bosses. Everybody, I'm a boss. I'm a, everybody want to wear a boss shirt. But you can't be a boss unless you learn how to serve under a boss. Anybody hear me up in here? All right? And most people claiming to be bosses, quite frankly, ain't ready to be no boss. And so you got to watch that. And, 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 and it's okay to, to, to speak those things that are not as though they were, but, but, but know where you are now, know how to serve now, and God going to open up doors for you to be a boss later. Anybody hear me up in there? All right. We also told you that though you are a boss, you are not a boss in every place. All right. You're going to go places where you're just simply not a boss. And so in the home, yeah, you're a boss over them children. In the home, you're the head over the home, man. But when you go to work, you're not the boss no more. All right. When you get downtown with the mayor, with the city councilman, you're not the boss no more. When you get in front of that judge, you're not the boss no more. And our people, let me for that matter, when you come to church, you're not the boss no more. All right? And so our people, y'all, we got the boss syndrome. Because everywhere we go, we think we the boss. All right? And let me tell you, let me tell you, there's always going to be somebody over you. All right? And when you run in every business and when you run in every institution and you, you listen, you've gained the whole world under you, there's still going to be somebody over you. And his name is the most high. Come on, give God some praise up in here. All right. So we got to learn how to play second fiddle. So we talked about this definition of unity and we talked about unity being so good and pleasant to the Lord. We talked about unity not being uniformity, which was a breath of fresh air for some people, because it was something that kind of enlightened us. Because sometimes we can come to churches and, and, and churches want to make us cookie cutters. You know, we, we cookie cut Christians. Everybody in the church hair like, you know what I'm saying? They all got bobs, mushrooms, everybody, everybody dressed like all long sleeve, all skirts to the ankles. All right. Somebody come in with a short sleeve shirt, break the spirit up, break the church up. Somebody let the devil in. No, no. You know what I'm saying? Unity don't mean uniformity. We're not all going to look alike. We're not all going to sound alike. We're going to have different interests, different ideas. huh? But true unity, hallelujah, when you know what unity is, true unity is diversity. Because it's in all those differences that we come together to work together towards a common good. Come on, give y'all some praise. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
And that's what unity is. And we learn that from the Godhead. Jesus said that you might be one as we are one. We learn that from the Godhead. And we ask the question, how is the Godhead one? The Godhead is one in purpose, all right? And we saw an example of that out of Gethsemane. The Godhead is also one in divine order. And we just, we just really pressed upon you the importance of order in our organizations and institutions. Everything from marriage to family to business to church, hallelujah, to our nation. Order is of utmost importance, all right? If you don't know how to be in order, there will be no unity, all right? Uh, order and unity go hand in hand, all right? And we just told you that just like in the case of Jesus, somebody in the organization has to be a nevertheless, all right? In a lot of organizations, marriages, and everything else, is too many chiefs and no Indians, all right? God has ordained somebody in every organization to be the chief. And you got to know your position. Am I a chief or am I a nevertheless? And when you understand that you are nevertheless, you do like Jesus. You, you, you make your request known, this is the way I would like it to go. But then you throw in a nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. All right. And that's true Christianity. That's true unity. That's true being a son and a daughter of the most high God. Come on, give y'all some praise up in this place. And lastly, we just talked about how in the last days God's going to bring our people together and we are going to choose or appoint or elect a head over Israel, a head over God's people. And that's when our people are going to be ready to move forward into the blessings that God has for us, even our own nation and our own land. But the order, the order and the unity has to be first. All right. And so we're going to get, get going, saints. Just a few quotes to remind you where we're going. Vince Lombardi said individual commitment to a group effort. That is what makes a team, a company, society and civilization work. Yeah, we individuals, but we got to be committed to a group effort. All right. We talked about Phil Jackson already. The strength of the pack is the wolf, but the strength of the wolf is the pack. Alexander the Great. Remember, upon the conduct of each depends the faith of us all. All right. And this is going to be important to what we talk about today. The African proverb, if you want to go quickly, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. All right. Uh, the next one, the sacrifice, remember, is unity, not for one another. Because some people you ain't going to want to sacrifice for. Quite frankly, you ain't going to like them. All right. But it's not about them. It's about the unity. All right. Uh, Hale Selassie, unity should be the cornerstone of all of our relationships. All right. Woodrow Wilson, we cannot be separated in the interest or divided in purpose. We stand together until the end. Winston Church here, when there is no enemy within, the enemies outside cannot hurt you. Come on, give y'all some praise up in this place. Amen. <laughs> hallelujah. And so y'all, hallelujah, I'm telling you, we're going deep into this. I'm spending time in it. I'm, 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 I'm bringing it back to your remembrance because I am believing by faith. That after we cover this, we're going to have a different church. Anybody hear me over here? We're going to have a different church. We're going to have a different leadership, a different deacons, different ministers, different body, just a whole different way of acting with each other. It's just going to be different, y'all. Because I believe the word of God when it says, if you prophesy to the dry bones, the dry bones going to hear the word and react to it. All right? The dry bones going to hear the word and react to it. And that's what we believe in. And so... Y'all, today, we're going to move to the second sub point of unity, and we're going to talk about the basis of the unity. And when I talk about the basis of unity, I'm talking about why are we unified? What's the basis for that? What's, what's, the, what's the, the commonality? You know what I'm saying? Uh, why are we unified as the people of God? And so we're going to cover that. Now, as we cover that, we're looking at uh, uh, John 17, verse 20. And uh, in 21, uh, uh, he says, uh, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. This is a powerful verse right here because Jesus is saying, I'm not just praying for the 12 right here. I'm praying for everybody that's going to believe on me 
through their word, Jesus says. That's all of us. <laughs> That's all of us. That prayer is for all of us. Then he says in 21, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they may also be one, watch this, in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The important part that we want to focus on in this verse is that they might be one in us. One in us. Two things about this promise. This promise is exclusive and exhaustive. Exclusive and exhaust, exhaustive. All right? When we say that this promise is exclusive, we mean that we will only be one in God. You hear what he says? That they might be one in us. What does that mean? There's no other way for us to be one but in God. You hear what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an exclusive promise. All right? And y'all, as a people, we're looking for unity. Lord, why the Hebrews can't get together? Why the Hebrews can't do business together? Why the Hebrews can't do this and do that? You know why? Because we're trying to do it outside of him. The unity is only in God, in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what the unity is. He says that they might be one in us. So as we, as, as, we, as, we, as we look at this basis, just always remember that the different things we cover, that it's an exclusive promise. We can only be unified in him. All right? And, and, and I want you to think about that. In your families, you can't be unified if one a believer and one is not. That's unequally yoke. Huh? How can two walk together except they be in agreement? Huh? Uh, in, in your business, huh? You, you can't be unified in your business if you the believer and you work with a whole bunch of worldlings, huh? Or you partners with a whole... No, it can't be no agreement there. In the church, huh? Can't be agreement in the house of God if, if most of the members are unregenerate. If the leadership, the ministers and deacons on the cool unsaved, huh? If the church not preaching the gospel like it should, you're going to have an unregenerate church. And when you have saved and the, and, 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 and the lost in the same house, a house divided against itself can't stand. All right? All right? And most of the problems in most churches, including this church, they come from unredeemed people. False brothers and sisters snuck in unawares, not even saved. Don't even really love the people of God. But somehow slip in and maybe even run up the ranks. And then when, when as, as, we, as, we, as, as we say, when hell break out, we wonder why. Well, we done let one of the sons and the daughters of hell in. How else hell not going to break out? All right? And so, so this is important. We can only be one in him. All right? It's a regenerate type of thing. But, but it's not only exclusive, it's exhaustive. Now, I won't, I won't preach this to Philadelphia. It's exhaustive. It's exclusive, but it's exhaustive. exhaustive. Pastor, what you mean about uh, uh, this promise being exhaustive? He said that they might be one in us. Who? Who be one in us? Everybody. Everybody. Not just the Hebrews. Yeah, it's okay if we be one with each other. But that's not the end game for God, no. God want all his sons and his daughters one in him. Black sons and white sons, Hebrew sons, Gentile sons, Asian sons, Latino sons, that they might all be one in us. He wanted to look like heaven going to look. Well, you look out and you see every nation, tribe, and tongue, every ethnicity, every nationality. That's what God really wants. That's the unity. It's not only exclusive. We can only do it in him, but it's exhaustive. It includes all the races of Adam's fallen seed. Anybody hear me up in here? That's what the Bible says. All right? Some of y'all too prejudiced to hear that. But it's going to be everybody in heaven, y'all. All right? All right? So let's keep on going. Let's talk about relational unity for a second. 
all right, as we talk about this basis of unity. How, how are we united? What's the basis for that? Huh? Psalm 133 and 1 describes it. It says, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren, for brethren to dwell together in unity. You see, it's not just unity with everybody, y'all. It's unity with the brethren, the brothers and the sisters. Huh? And that's why we say it's relational because it's based on relationship. All right. Uh, we have unity one with another, the believers, because we are family. Anybody remember that song? We are family. All right. All right. That's what the believers have. It's a relational unity. It's, it's kindred. It's relationship. It's based on family. Now, as the Hebrews, y'all, we brothers and sisters by blood, by history. By tracing our people all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Huh? And so that's one basis of unity. But I want to tell you here this morning that bloodline is not enough. Bloodline is not enough. Yeah, we all black, we all Hebrew, all right? But I want to tell you, not everybody Hebrew, that's Hebrew. Woo! That's what the Bible says. I'm telling you right now, in Romans 9, 6, for they are not all Israel, huh? For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. It's going to be some Hebrews, some black folk, you just can't get on one accord with. All right? And it's not an issue of race. It's not an issue of ethnicity. It's an issue of faith. Are you with me here so far? All right? Because no matter what the nationality is, if they're not with your God, they're going to want to take you some places where your God don't want you to go. All right. All right. And so it's relational, y'all. Our unity is based upon us being part of the family of almighty God. And listen, this is going to be deep, but we're going in. Can y'all swim with me this morning? All right. The unity is in God. That's what it is. We have a lot of people trying to be unified with people who not saved. And you can't do that. You can't walk together unless you be in agreement. All right. Uh, our agreement comes from us being brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, how are we how are we made brothers and sisters of Christ? I'm glad you asked. We are made brothers and sisters through adoption, yes, through adoption. The theological framework that we call adoption, all right? You see, Jesus is the only begotten son of the father. He's the only real son. Anybody hear me up in here? All right? There's many creatures, and in the world they say we all sons and daughters of God. That's not true. We all created by God, but we ain't all sons and daughters. All right? So let's get that straight. Listen, Jesus is the only begotten son of God. He's the only one that can say, I'm, I'm blood born and my daddy is literally the father. All right. Nobody naturally in creation can say that. All right. And the reason is, is because our sins separate us from our God. We disqualify ourselves from being sons and daughters of God. But the good news is Jesus' mission on earth through the cross was to get us saved, forgiven, and then, watch this, adopted. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. He was sent here as the only begotten son, but his mission, when you look it up in Romans 8.28, was, 8.29, was to be the firstborn of many brethren. All right? He came here with the mission, hallelujah, to be the big brother. But after he, would, he was done, he would have little brothers and sisters. Anybody glad for adoption this morning? All right. All right. Galatians 4 and 4 tells us this, his mission, quite clearly. It says, but when the fullness of time was come, that's the perfect time in history, politics, geography, uh, world empires. When the fullness of time had come. God sent forth his son, his only begotten son, Yahshua HaMashiach, 
made of a woman. You see, he existed before he was born, pre-incarnate, but he was made of a woman, born in human flesh. He was made under the law during the dispensation of the Old Covenant, the Ten Commandments. All right, verse 5. What was his mission? To redeem them that were under the law. All right? That word redeem means to buy back. Mm. To purchase back. It also means to set free. You see, you was a slave before Jesus came. A slave to Satan, a slave to the world, and a slave to yourself. Hallelujah. You was a slave of sin. Hallelujah. You was no better than the slaves before the Civil War. You was on the plantation, and the taskmaster, the plantation master, was old Lucifer himself. But thank God we had a big brother come to redeem us. Anybody hear me up in here? All right. He came to redeem us, to buy us back, to pay Satan, to pay the world, to pay the Father what we owed. Because the wages of sin is death. And Yahshua gave sin, Satan, and everybody else what we had owed to set us free. He came to redeem them that were under the law. But why? Why did he come to redeem us? That we might receive the adoption of sons. Come on, give y'all some praise. Woo! Because without the redemption, there can be no adoption. Without the forgiveness, there can be no taking in. The first son, the only begotten, makes us, hallelujah, available to be adopted by the most high God. Come on, that's some good news. Somebody got to shout. <laughs> hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, now, some of y'all might not know what adoption really is, all right? But adoption is a legal process, all right, by which an individual, a person who is not a part of a family becomes legally a part of that family. They not only become a part in, in, in geographics where they kind of move in, no, but they are part of the family through rights, privileges, and benefits. They get all the rights, privileges, and benefits of a full-blown child, a blood-born child. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now, I just told you that the father only had one begotten son. Hey, my God, my God, my God. When we get adopted, we get all the rights, the benefits, the privileges, even the inheritance of the only begotten son. <laughs> That's why he said, whatever you ask in my name, hey, the father's going to give you. Listen, when you want to know how good the father is to you, just look how good he is to Jesus. Because whatever he's done for Jesus, he would do it for you. My God, that's why Jesus says, hallelujah, the things that I do shall you do also. Amen. And greater works than these shall you do. Because I go to the Father. It's the adoption process. All right? And the Romans and the Greeks that, that, that Paul and, and, and them writing to, they understood adoption quite clearly. Because now, today, adoption was only, is only with little children, mostly. But in the Roman days, hallelujah, they were adopting full-grown men. Because it wasn't about taking care of a child. It was about meeting somebody that you wanted to leave everything to. So a man or God might not have children. Or he might have children that really don't respect and really don't want to take care of everything. And so in the Roman days, they would look out and see a man or a woman that was worthy and say, I don't have nobody to leave my stuff to, but I see that you're worthy. I see that, hallelujah, you're going to use it right. I see that you're going to take care of some business. So I want to adopt you, put my name on you, that way everything that I own, all my acres, all my farms, all my land, all my gold, all my check. You understand what I'm saying? It all belongs to you. All right? All right? And that's what the Most High has done for us. He's adopted us into the household of God. Come on, give him some praise up in here. Woo! And you see, the, the wealthier uh, 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 the person is that adopt you is the most excited you'll get. <laughs> see, if I went through here and I say, Oprah adopted you, you'd get excited. Oh, God. If I come through here and say Bill Gates adopted you, some of y'all look, y'all get excited. Huh? See, when I say the most high done adopted you, <laughs> this is the one that owned the cattle on a thousand hills. 
is the one that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. This is the one that the angels bow to that they worship. This is the one that's holy. This is the one that's omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. This is the one that could never lose, never fail. This is your legal father. You have been adopted by the most high God. So don't you ever talk about you come from a poor family because you come from the richest family in heaven and on earth. <laughs> in fact, woman of God, your daddy is a king. Anybody hear me up in here? Hey! Because you've been adopted into the household of God. And that's what that means when he talks about in Ephesians 2 and 19. He tells the people of God, now therefore you are no more strangers, foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. All right? You in his house now. All right? You a son, you a daughter, his name is upon yours. And let me tell you something, God takes care of all his children. There's no, there's no deadbeat daddy. You're going to have to renew your mind and get a paradigm shift because, hallelujah, there, there might be some things in your past stopping you from appreciating how much a good, good father this father is because your daddy didn't take care of you. Your daddy ain't put his name on the birth certificate. Your daddy missed the game. But this daddy ain't going to miss a single thing. This daddy know the hairs on your head. This daddy is always with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. This daddy is a provider. This daddy is called Jireh. This is a good, good father. It's who he is. And sometimes we need to go to the word and renew our mind about fatherhood and about what a father looks like. Because when you realize you've been adopted, huh? Huh? That he went through the orphanage. Huh? The richest man in the, in the city went through the orphanage. Huh? And saw you playing on the floor and you ain't had nobody. And the orphanage he went through, went through it, was a, it was a bad one. It was a dirty one. You was chained up on the floor. Huh? It, it was a slave uh, 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 orphanage. And he walked through there as rich as rich can be. And all the kids hoping that he picked them. Everybody hoping. Everybody looking with tears in their eyes. Please pick me. And the Lord passed by you and he saw you in your blood. <laughs> and he said unto you, live. He said, you're going to be mine. He called you by your name. He said, Keith, come on in. I'm adopting you. Grace, come on in. I'm adopting you. Bell, come on in. I'm adopting you. Anthony, come on in. I'm adopting you. Annalise, I'm adopting you. Chantel, I'm adopting you. Omar, I'm adopting you. Carl, I'm adopting you. Take the chain off their own. Take the chain off their leg. You don't put a chain on a king's son and daughter. My God, my God, my God. That's what adoption means. That's what adoption means. And when he says anything in my name, listen, the king's children back in the day, they were given rings. Like the prodigal son, when he came back, they gave him his ring back. Y'all know how would that mean to have your ring back? The ring was the family signet. The ring was how you bought stuff. <laughs> Today, the ring would be like the family credit card. You know, when you get old enough, you're going to get a credit card. Lord, I better not tell them children that. When you're old enough, you get a credit card. And it's not your name on the credit card. It's the daddy's name. It's the mama's name on the credit card. <laughs> you do like them people. You might put them like uh, as, a, as a signer also on the credit card to build a credit. But we get into finance. But listen, hallelujah. But the ring was that whenever they move around town, Miss Diane, and they wanted to buy something, huh? They didn't have to pull out no money. Do you know who I am? They just put the ring in ink and they stuck, stuck a stamp on it. The stamp had the family name on it. They didn't even charge me. They said, oh, oh you're from that family? Take as many as you want. Just put, your, just put the family name on it. You see, we got the family name. He said, ask it in Jesus' name. <laughs> that's our stamp that's the ring that's the signet you know and we just got to believe that and to receive that we walking around this marketplace of a world needing things but not understanding our authority not understanding the power of the ring we've been given in the spirit look at your hand right now son of God look at your hand daughter of God there's a ring on your hand 
You can't see it in the natural, but most high, give them spiritual eyes right now. There's a ring on your hand. There's a ring on your hand. And that ring got initials on it. <laughs> Jesus the Christ. <laughs> Yeshua Hamashiach. Come on now. You're going to have to start placing some orders. You're going to have to start putting some things down. You're going to have to start walking through some things. I need this house. I need this car. And I want it in Jesus' name. Why? Because of me? No. Because I've been adopted and I'm royalty. Hey! <laughs> the answer is yes. My God. Hallelujah. The answer is yes. And so this bond that we have is relational. All right? We just not church members, no, y'all. We just not people from Lafayette and Brobridge and Cairn Crow and Alaska. <laughs> Eunice. Eunice. <laughs> All right. We are sons and daughters of God. Now, if I'm a son of God and you're a son of God, that makes us brothers and sisters. <laughs> You see, before we say we don't understand that, why they call each other brother this and sister that? In Philadelphia, we don't do the sister because it just sounds funny. But, you know, but, but, but we are actually brothers and sisters. That's why the, the basis of unity is relational. Because we are family. We're just not asking you to be unified because, like, y'all strangers and y'all don't know. No. No. Y'all have the same daddy. <laughs> Y'all have the same daddy. All right? That's the basis of the unity. We've all been adopted. And, and, and Jesus takes the way his children treat each other seriously. All right? I don't know about y'all, but, but, but you, if you have more than one child, how you feel when they mistreat each other? What kind of things you say to them? You look at them and you'd be like, God. <laughs> That's your brother. That's your sister. That's family. When everybody else turn against you, that's the ones that's supposed to be there for you. Supposed to be, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you don't treat family any kind of way. And I threaten my children. I tell him, I say, touch my daughter again. <laughs> now I'm talking to my daughter, yeah, but I say, touch my daughter again. I'm talking to my son, yeah, touch my son, touch my daughter again. Because that's how I feel about mine. Anybody feel that way about yours? How much more so God? God loved his children so much, y'all. Jesus said, whatsoever you've done to the least of these, my brethren, my brethren, he said, you've done it unto me. I'm talking about the least Christian, the one just saved, the one still acting majority in the flesh. You know the ones, the least. He said, but don't touch them now. Keep your mouth off them now. Because that's mine. The least of them. The most immature. You, you ain't got to even be touching the mature ones. He said, he said the least of them. What does that teach us? Keep your hands off of each other. Keep your mouth off of each other. You know what I'm saying? Drink water and mind your business. Come to church and go home. Because you don't want to play with none of God's children. All right? Our relationship should make us unified. He tells us in Galatians 6 and 10, he said, do good to everyone, but especially to the household of faith. And this, not, this just don't mean stop doing each other wrong, but this means look out to do good for one another. Because what you've done for the least of these, my brethren, not only applied to the bad you do, but it applied to the good you do. 
When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I didn't have clothing, you gave me clothing. When I couldn't pay my light bill, you paid that. You was looking out for my children. And the fathers take it as you was looking out for me. Woo! Man, brother Carl, who could do your children good and you not be happy, man? So that's how the father operates. Listen, y'all, he takes that kind of stuff seriously. Look at 1 John 2, starting at verse 9. We're just going to talk about that. You know, you know uh, how we treat each other really shows whether we saved or not. He said, he that said he is in the light and hate his brother is in darkness even now. All right. The way we treat each other show whether we really we really we children or not. And sometimes we could be so bad to the people of God it's proof positive that we're not a child of God ourselves. All right. And that's how you can tell you're going to have some in the church and they cutting up, carrying up, causing division, cutting up in the church. And you're like, man, what's going on? Why are they like that? It's, it's emblematic that they're not even children of God because they hate their brothers and their sisters deep down inside. And the Bible says, listen, if that's the case, you in darkness even until now. You know, keep on going to verse 10. He's saying his word. Hallelujah. Do we have verse 10? He that loveth his brother abided in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. Do we have another verse? Hallelujah. But he that hate his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and know not where he goes, because that darkness had blinded his eyes. Now, let me tell you something right now, man. We got to get along, y'all. You can't hate nobody in here, no. You can't hate your brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'm not saying you're not going to dislike people in here, because some people aggravate. I understand that. Some of y'all aggravate. Listen, it's real. All right? But as brothers and sisters, we can't hate one another. All right? All right? You use wisdom and not be around them a lot. You know what I'm saying? But you can't hate them. Because even if you're a believer and and, and you got bad, a bad heart towards a brother or sister in Christ. Let's just say you're a believer, but you're falling in a bad place with unforgiveness and bitterness and things of that nature. What this Bible verse is also saying is, is that when you hate a brother or sister in Christ, that bad, a darkness is going to come over you. And you're going to walk in darkness. Meaning that grudge and that bitterness and that unforgiveness going to blind you. You ain't going to even know where you're going. There'll be no progress in life. There'll be no direction in life. You ain't going to be able to find which way the spirit wants you to go. Why? Because you, you're filled with this bitterness and this hate. You can't find your way with it. You're walking in darkness and you don't know where you're going. Because the darkness had blinded his eyes. Got a word for you up in here. If you got unforgiveness over somebody in this church, or even a believer outside this church, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. All right? All right? Because you'll be walking in darkness, and that's why you've been moving in circles for the last 10 years. You see? You see? Our commonality is based upon our relationship in Christ, you see? Now, what this means to me on a deep level is this church, y'all, uh, we are a Christian church. And when I say Christian, we, 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 you know, you could get upset at the word if you want, but, but, but we are a church that's centered around the Messiah, Yahshua HaMashiach. All right, anybody hear that? All right. Now, you know, we might be different in the sense of who we believe the Hebrews are, all right? Uh, uh, and you're going to find other Christian churches who, who, who may not like us because of our belief about the Hebrews. But what get me is, is that they would rather fellowship with uh, another people who claim to be us, who curse the Messiah, who say his mama was a harlot, who don't believe in him at all, 
And they would rather fellowship and send money to them than invite us when they're doing something in the city. The church is acting foolish. You see? Because the basis of our unity is, is us being adopted. We believers, y'all. Them fake ones ain't believers. Anybody hear me up in here? But the mainstream church in love with the Ashkenazis are loving the people that deny the Messiah. Now, last time I checked my Bible, but I'm going to move on. It just was on some of my heart. In 1 John 4 and 2, John told us that we should watch out for the spirit of Antichrist. And that we shouldn't fellowship with that spirit of Antichrist. Come on, put it up there for me. I want it up on here, too, on the back. 1 John 4, did we, did we give it to you? Hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Now, Philadelphia, do we confess that Jesus Christ has come to earth in the flesh? Yes, we do. That means that the spirit of God is here. And this, this is deep, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a small saying, but to believe this, we believe in Jesus, that Jesus is the Christ, that he came from heaven to earth, born of a virgin. We believe all that. That's where you're going to find the spirit of God. The mother fake Hebrews, they don't believe this. All right? Let, let, go, go to the next verse in verse 3. Huh? He said, everybody, you know the spirit of God. In verse 3, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus is the Christ, is come in the flesh, is what? Is not of God. And this is the spirit of who? The Antichrist. Wherefore you have heard that it should come even now already is in the world. Modern Christendom is playing with a spirit of Antichrist. Yes, Sending money to a people of the Antichrist. You know, while the real people of the book sitting right in their country. Come on, give y'all some praise up in here. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm talking about it. Churches in this city don't wave at me no more when I pass. And here I am, I'm a believer in Yahshua. Yes. We're sending thousands of dollars to people who curse their Messiah every day. On, you know? The basis of our unity is relationship. Come on, y'all still up? All right. Let's keep going for a few more, y'all. We're we going deep, but we're bringing it. We're going deep. The basis of our unity is also spiritual. I switched it up. We were supposed to do foundational, but we're going to do spiritual right here. The base of our unity is also spiritual. All right? All right? I say that the basis of our unity is also spiritual because when we get adopted, when we get saved, we all receive the same spirit. Yes, sir. The same spirit. I'm talking about the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit. The paraclete. Anybody hear me up in here? The comforter. All right? And we should all be unified because we have the same spirit living on every single one of us that's a believer. It means that on the outside we're different, but on the inside, we the same. Ooh, are y'all hearing me up in here? And we're pulling this from John 17, 22. Watch this. <clears throat> Jesus says this in the prayer. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given to them. What glory you gave to them? Huh? That they may be one, even as we are one. What glory you gave to them? Look at verse 23. This is the glory. This is the glory in verse 23. I in them and thou in me, that they may be perfect in one. Jesus said he was going to give us a glory. A glory that was going to be on the inside of us. And when you looked at that glory close, it would be Jesus in us and the Father in Jesus. <laughs> the Godhead sitting on the inside of us. Huh? Huh? My God. The Holy Ghost. 